Welcome to our Synthetic Intelligence Forum session on an AI masterclass focusing on artificial general intelligence. We have the privilege of being joined by Dr. Jordi Rose, the CEO of Sanctuary AI and the co-founder of D-Wave, Kindred AI and Sanctuary AI. I think it is not an exaggeration to say that uh, Dr. Rose is probably the most ex extraordinary and exemplary technology entrepreneur in Canada. And uh, that's why we, we, couldn't, we couldn't make it work with just one session. So we're going to have him come back again to focus on a different topic. But for now, Dr. Rose, I'd like to pass the mic to you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks. That's, that's very flattering. Thank you, Vic. Um, uh, and thanks for having me here to talk about two things that are both uh, very dear to my heart and things that I've worked on for most of my professional career. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is, um, is general intelligence. Um, so I'm going to, I'm just, I'm, the, the slides that I'm using, yes, there they are. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to use them and uh, if anything goes wrong, just let me know. So um, first thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is how we got here uh, or how I got here. So I started my career as a theoretical physicist and from that um, founded D-Wave. D-Wave was a pioneer in the, or is a pioneer in the quantum computing industry. And D-Wave was um, a, a very, very interesting first company, let's say. Uh, I think that things like D-Wave are not usually the first thing that an entrepreneur would try to do. Uh, but in, in my case, it just kind of uh, happened by happenstance that there was an overlap between the, uh, the things that I was working on in my PhD and, and the opportunity to build this new kind of computer that back in 1999 was um, more of a twinkle in theorists' eyes than anything. So I was there for a while, and uh, during the later stages of my time there, the uh, the the customers of the company were largely uh, big organizations that cared an awful lot about AI. And so we, I, my job uh, became increasingly trying to understand how to map AI problems to the exotic type of hardware that we were building. And from that, I kind of uh, became immersed in the whole AI world and, and started to become increasingly uh, entranced and fascinated by it uh, more than the the uh, the quantum stuff, and that led to uh, Kindred. So in 2014, I and a couple other folks um, started a company that was going to try to use uh, new ideas in artificial intelligence to try to build robot control systems of a new kind, and and that was quite successful. Um, Kindred was acquired uh, about a month or two ago. Um, and it continues to be the best at what it does in the world. Uh, and it started in Canada. Uh, sanctuary is my third thing. And Sanctuary is is uh, is like Kindred in the, the style of work that's being done. It's about control systems and robots, but it's got the flavor of the ambition of D-Wave where what we're trying to do is um, is, so, is essentially solve the general intelligence problem using a particular thesis about how the right way to, to go about that is. So what I wanted to, to start with um, is talk a little bit about the, uh, the general intelligence problem and, and why uh, the people who work on it are so zealous and passionate so about it. So when I was um, when I was about 12, we got our first computer in the house and it was a uh, TRS-80. And the reason that the uh, the computer ended up in our house was my dad wanted to use it to run VisiCalc, which was uh, a spreadsheet program, in support of his day job. So that was the ostensibly the reason why we bought the machine. But of course, being 12, I had absolutely no interest in spreadsheets. Uh, what I wanted to do was play games. And uh, one of the games that I bought and uh, and was maybe a major turning point in my life was Dungeons of Dagoreth, which was one of the one of the early games um, that uh, kind of uh, presaged the emergence of the video game industry, a classic game to this day. But the point here is that the reason why computers um, ended up becoming so important in human civilization has its root in this this observation that computers are general purpose in the sense that the computers themselves are not designed to do one thing and one thing only. They're designed to be able to do a host of different things. This, uh, it, they have this general purpose character. They're not machines designed specifically to run spreadsheets or to run 
a certain kind of video game. You can do all that and more with them. Of course, there are things about the, the technium, you know, the sum total of our, of our technological achievements that are even more general than computers. For example, electricity. Back when I was 12 in our home, we also had lights uh, and plumbing and stoves and toasters and all of that sort of thing. Um, and they all required electricity. So in some sense, electricity is, uh, is a more general technology than computers or light bulbs or any of the things that it runs on it. All those things depend on it for its function. So you might ask, you know, is this, is this way of looking at the world, you know, more and more general um, technologies, where's the root of it all? And the, the answer is clear. So every, every part of the technium, you know, every artifact that humanity has ever created comes from the processes that run in our minds. So all of the things that we have, not just the technical things, would the, the, the houses and the cars and the cell phones and the, and the cancer cures and all of those things, all that technology and science, that's part of it. But of course, it includes everything else. It includes every every book ever written, every poem ever written, every piece of music ever constructed, every emotion that any human has ever felt, every thought that any human has ever thought originates in one place. It's within the human mind. So in the language of general purpose technologies, the human mind is the general purpose technology of all human experience. There is no exception to this. And uh, this is a little bit of a weird idea if it's the first time you've heard of it, but there is literally nothing in the human, in the, in the arena of human experience that doesn't exist within a human mind. So the, this thing is somehow foundational to everything. And so the study of the human mind and how it works is not a story about technology. The reason why people want to understand minds has a technical aspect, of course, because the way that modern science and technology works is follows a certain well-worn path that we understand is an appropriate way to look at nature. You know, you do experiments, you observe, you create theories, you apply them. But it's more than that. The quest to understand the mind is the most fundamental activity that humans can ever work on. There is nothing more fundamental or important than the understanding of how the human mind works. All human flourishing, all, all consequences of all of our actions and, and behaviors in the future boil down to things that originate within this one place. So understanding it is absolutely the number one most important thing there is. So what's the prize of studying the mind? All of that which is already a very big prize, but there's more. Because if you can understand how the human mind works, presumably you can build them. And if you can build them, that means that you have the power to imbue the inert metal and plastic of the machines that we build with the same properties that I'm talking about. These things that we hold dear, which are make us who we are, we can take that knowledge and replicate it in other venues and other substrates. So understanding the mind has this enormous bounty, which is the biggest prize that humans have ever gone after, which is understanding our place in the universe, who we are at some fundamental level. But it's more than that, because once we've done that, we can create a Cambrian explosion of things that share some of those basic properties, but are way better than us at certain kinds of things. Already, my calculator that you know costs 15 bucks on my desk can multiply two integers way faster than I ever could. Those kinds of wins that you get from changing substrate or doing a problem in a different way can be used in the context of running things like our minds as well. So the prize is vast. Um, here's one way of looking at this, that if we can solve this problem, 
And let's say we're the only thing like us in the entire universe. That's highly unlikely, but let's say it's true. Then the future expands from this ball of rock that we live on into the, the, the rest of the balls of rock that we that are part of our universe. And if we're the only thing like us, then our descendants flourish into the vast cosmos. And these these things that we're talking about today, at this point in time of human history, being able to attack these problems have consequences that have echoes into the 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 billions of years, the eons that will follow us. So the opportunity to work on something that could potentially be so meaningful that it's the root cause of things that happen billions of years in the future and that that go out into the 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 far reaches of space and 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 propagate things like us. I don't understand why anybody would work on anything else. <laughs> so this is this is the motivation for working on this problem. But there's another side of this, and I think part of the reason why uh, folks are, are reticent to attack this problem directly is that the problem is is exceptionally hard in a bunch of ways, and it's uh, I'm often asked to compare the difficulty of this this problem to quantum computing, which I worked on for quite a while, and they're they're not even in the same category. So quantum computing is a problem for which the specification of what you want to build is basically given to you. You know exactly what it is. The problem is then the execution problem of actually constructing the thing that you have uh, um, an idea about what you want to build. Uh, AGI or general intelligence is a totally different kind of problem in that we have no blueprint, we have no specification. We And, and in fact, what I'm going to do mostly here is talk about a particular problem, which is that the way that we think about the problem, the, the the framing of it, comes from the device that we're trying to under to, to to parse. So it's a very strange problem that the the tool we're using to try to to try to understand the problem is the thing that we're trying to understand. Now that this this is a weird thing, right? Let's say I was to say I I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that. So let's say I have a bulldozer in front of my house. And I was to say, okay, using only the bulldozer, figure out how the bulldozer works. Now that's a, an absurd thing, right? Like you could never think that that could be a thing. It's just outside of the scope of possibility for that machine. If that's too absurd for you, how about we look at um, a songbird? Do you think that the songbird has enough of whatever the right ingredients are to understand how the songbird's mind works? It's very unlikely that that would ever happen. So we have this conceit that our minds are somehow in a categorically different space, that we have the capacity of the native tools that we've inherited from evolution to be able to solve this problem. But maybe that's not true. And I'm going to show you why uh, th this is a difficult uh, uh, place. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the technical aspects of general intelligence, but what I will talk about is something that's more important than the technical aspects, and that's a meta problem. It's a problem that sits on top of all of the technological things. And what it really boils down to is this, is that the words we use to describe our mind and the properties of it, like intelligence, uh, consciousness, purpose, all these sorts of things are terribly ill-defined. They're vague, unhelpful, in uh, in a in a phrase that you know the physicists use uh, uh, in a highly derogatory way, they're not even wrong. A lot of these ideas, and a lot of the work that we do as scientists resides, for obvious reasons, in this intuition bubble that we have from our subjective experience about how we think minds work. But it's very possible, and in fact, I think it's almost obvious that the solutions to these problems don't reside anywhere near our intuitions. They just they reside somewhere else where all of these things are not true. And we have to, as scientists, um, remember that human thought has a long history of wanting things to be true that aren't. So Galileo's time, and I'm not picking on that particular time specifically, it's just an example. This is a, a thing that happens throughout human history. They had a bunch of political beliefs, I think you would call them, that it was 
uh, necessary that the Earth was the center of the universe. Of course, it wasn't. So how did we find out? How did we break this dogma that everybody believed was true and wanted to believe was true? The answer was observation is that we have to look and see what's true about the world and let our views be guided by what we believe is true from observation, not from intuition or politics. So what we're going to try to do here is look at one of these difficult problems where an intuition that we have conflicts with what we know about the physical world. So I'm going to turn I'm going to turn make a left turn now and I'm going to start talking about physics and what we know about it and how at least one of the very dearly held beliefs we have about how cognition works is incompatible with modern physics. And I'm not saying it's wrong because modern physics could just as well be wrong. But what I am saying is without a shadow of a doubt the things we know to be true about the world in the sense of having physical laws that describe them are not compatible with something you believe right now. And I'm going to show you uh, why that is. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to break down modern physics into two kind of pillars of, of worldview. These two pillars of worldview are, uh, are derived using different types of approaches. They're frameworks that are largely incompatible with each other, which points to a way out of this conundrum I'm going to show you maybe. But um, they're both, they both seem to be very effective, sensible, uh, well-grounded views of the way the world works. So the first is the theory of general relativity and also special relativity as a, as a, as a subset of this. But essentially, the theory of general relativity starts from the premise that the laws of physics can't depend on um, uh, the, uh, the uh, velocity. So let's boil it down to that. Is that if I'm in what's called an inertial frame, which means that I'm not accelerating, the laws of physics in that frame have to be the same as the laws of physics in another inertial frame. So that's a very simple thing. You can say that makes sense. It's, it accords with our observations. Uh, and when you start from that premise and derive Einstein's equations from it, what you find is, among other things, that, the, um, that everything is determined from having the conditions of any particular slice of this thing. So what if I know what there is to know about the world now, the future is deterministic, which means that there is no there is no deviation from the what the equations say. Um, it's purely um, a, a mathematical exercise to go from where you are now to where you are later. Uh, there's no indeterminacy anywhere in this picture. The second big pillar of modern physics is quantum mechanics. Now, I'm not, I was not a general relativity guy when I was doing theory, uh, although it was, I've always found it interesting. And I suppose as a hobby, I've, I've committed to trying to understand it quite deeply. But quantum mechanics is another thing. So quantum mechanics is where I cut my teeth, both as a, as a, as a, as a research scientist and then later in my professional career. So I'm going to show you something about quantum mechanics. And uh, I have to say that quantum mechanics is very different than general relativity. General relativity is exceptionally simple, it, not mathematically. It's hard to, to figure out how to do all the equation-y kinds of things. But um, the, quantum mechanics is not. Quantum mechanics is one of these things that you have to really sit with for a long time. And what I mean by that is decades to really fully appreciate well, the subtleties involved in all these things. So I'm going to, to the extent I can, give you some of my, my decades of sitting with this and working with machines that use it. So what I'm showing you here is a very simple type of quantum experiment where you fire a particle of light at, uh, at a device which uh, we'll call a half-silvered mirror. And the, if you set this up just so, what you can find is that the particle of light either bounces off the mirror or it goes through it. And um, you can set it up so that the probabilities of these two things are, um, are roughly equal, although it doesn't really matter what they are. Let's say they're 50-50. So in one of those scenarios, um, the particle of light bounces off and fires detector two. And another one, it, it goes through and fires detector one. Now, for a bunch of reasons that I won't go into, the state of this device um, is a very peculiar thing where the, uh, uh, and, and one of the ways that you can, you can see this is you can recombine those things later, those, those two paths later, where 
unless you actually have a fairly unless you have a large thing associated with the the firing of the detector like you know a flash of light or something like that these two states are in what's called a superposition um, they they're not a, a classical mixture of the two states but some kind of a strange um, combination of the two now, uh, uh, I'm going to now go from that, and there's this is kind of quantum mechanics 101, that you can set up these types of superposition states. And by the way, you know, it, the first 10 years of my time at D-Wave, we built literally millions of these things, and they agree with the predictions of quantum mechanics to as many decimal places as you can, you can measure. So it seems like, at least at the scale of the lab, things that you can actually build, this, all of the business about quantum mechanics seems to, seems to, to hold. So now we're going to take this another step further. So there's this uh, iPhone app that you can download called Universe Splitter. And what it does is it connects you to a machine that's essentially this thing in somewhere in Switzerland, uh, built by a company called ID Quantique, which, uh, which actually does this. So when you hit the button split universe, what happens is the, the, uh, the signal from your, your app goes to this thing and it actually runs the experiment and which detector is fired is sent back to you. And the fun thing about this, uh, and by the way, you can download this for two bucks from the uh, the app store. And if you want to play with it and understand it a little bit better, um, I recommend it. It's really, really fun. Uh, and it's real. It's actually connected to a real thing. So what you can do here is you can say, well, I'm going to make a really important decision about my life. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait and see what this happened to this, this universe splitter thing, this thing where you can the photon can go one way or the other. And then I'm going to actually do whatever the photon tells me to do. So in this case, uh, you can take a chance or you can play it safe. Um, so let's imagine that this dude, uh, Valery Rozov, who's a, a Russian base jumper, well, a very famous guy who jumps off things using this <laughs> terribly not good enough suit. Um, and we're going to decide whether after climbing to this giant peak at nearly 8,000 meters, we're going to jump off this cliff or not. Now, jumping off the cliff or not is a major decision that involves an awful lot of atoms and a lot of consequences <laughs> in the real world. Uh, but we're going to allow this to happen based solely on this microscopic quantum mechanical event amplified up from the quantum world into our real world. So what happens here is that the um, the the detector one fires and Rozov jumps off the cliff with all of the attendant results. But there's another possibility that detector two fired and Rozov said, not today, I'm going to go back down to base camp and I'm, I'm going to live to fight another day and try this another time. Now, our intuition is that one of these things happened and the other one didn't. But that is not what quantum mechanics says at all. And uh, I wanted to make a point for those of you who maybe have studied quantum mechanics or, or are interested in this business, is that the, the, the process where the quantum mechanical system, when you treat the entirety of the environment as quantum mechanical, like Rozoff and his suit and everything, all of its environment is all subject to the rules of quantum mechanics, doesn't allow for interpretation. So you all, maybe if you've heard of the interpretations of quantum mechanics, like the Copenhagen interpretation and blah, blah, blah. There are no interpretations of quantum mechanics taken seriously that are not this. So what quantum mechanics taken seriously means is that there are two, in this case, there are many more than two, but let's say at least two branches of this quantum mechanical thing called the wave function. And the reason why you think you're in one and not the other is that is, is, uh, is something I'm going to talk about shortly. But the point is that both of these outcomes, where the detector fired and he jumped off and the detector didn't fire and he didn't, both of those are valid. They're both real in the same sense. Um, and maybe most important for what I wanted to talk about today is that the outcome of which of these paths is taken in this particular scenario is entirely and fundamentally random. 
So the rules of quantum mechanics are very explicit about how you determine which of these branches you're in. It's entirely random in a very fundamental way. We're not talking about like approximate randomness like you have in classical physics where you just don't know the initial conditions well enough to predict. This is essential indeterminism of a sort that doesn't exist anywhere in physics. So this is a, a type of indeterminism for which there is no cause. There's nothing more fundamental that is a hidden variable that's sitting behind the scenes and if you only you knew it, then it would be deterministic or whatever. No, this is entirely, entirely random. And again, this is what quantum mechanics says. That's not necessarily the way nature is, but quantum mechanics says that at least in this particular case, which of these two things you end up in is entirely and completely random. So quantum mechanics is this weird thing that has uh, two different um, uh, uh, features that are very difficult to reconcile uh, at first until again, you sit with it for a while. And the, the, the key to reconciling all of the weirdness of quantum mechanics is taking it seriously. And what that means is that there is no sense of a, uh, like in the Copenhagen interpretation, there's an idea of an observer and what they call the collapse of the wave function and all that sort of thing. Ignore all of that because it doesn't make any sense. It's logically incoherent. It's basically adding an ad, ad hoc thing that makes no sense to a beautiful theory that seems to work all the time. Instead, what we're gonna do is say the entire universe is quantum mechanical. The entire universe has a wave function. The entire universe follows the laws of quantum mechanics without fail, and there is nothing else. So this is, this is accepting the reality of, of, of quantum mechanics and the, the call it the many worlds uh, um, picture. So what does this all mean? So the first thing is quantum mechanics, when you look at the entire system, like the, the whole universe has a property called unitarity. And again, there is isn't there is a potential out here which has to do with the overlap with general relativity and specifically black holes. But let's take, let's take that out for a second and just think about the, the rest of the, the story. So in the, the, um, uh, the, the, the whole a wave function of the universe picture, there's a very interesting and startling fact that every branch, that is any possible outcome of a sequence of, of the sorts of decisions that this universe splitter is making, which by the way are happening in the enormous numbers every every microsecond of, of, of time in the universe is that things are being quote unquote decided all the time. There is an awful lot more than just seven <laughs> branches of this wave function. There's an enormous number. But the point stands that the values of the probabilities of being in any one of these branches are deterministic. So what that means is that if I had the uh, compute power uh, which is a little bit of a weird thing to think about um, because this contains everything. So you're computing something that is inside of it, but put that aside for a minute. Then I could determine the uh, probabilities of being in any pot potential outcome uh, that's consistent with the laws of quantum mechanics. And there's a countable number of these. This is not infinite. Uh, there's a number and each of them has a, has a probability. And it's deterministic. That probability is deterministic, as is all of the state variables in each of these branches. So what these branches mean is that everything is about the universe is known. And that probability of that outcome can be computed. But what can't be computed based on quantum mechanics is which of these we are actually in. So this is a very strange thing but it's what quantum mechanics says, is that the, the different branches, the different outcomes have deterministic probabilities, but which of them we're in is fundamentally random. And by the way, when I mean which of them we're in is fundamentally random, I mean that every single decision point that makes these things different, every single one is fundamentally random every single one without exception. That's what quantum mechanics says. So when you get to this, this stage of being like today, you know, we're, we're having a discussion now over this, you know, video conference, the one that we're in is the sequence of a whole bunch of things like that universe splitter thing, where what happened 
was random in a fundamental way for which there is no cause. So each, so you might ask, well, okay, so you're telling me this, this story about the way nature might be that you, you claim is quantum, what quantum mechanics says, but I don't feel like there's a bunch of other me's going around doing different things or having different decisions or, you know, different consequences. So, you know, for example, in, in this one, this purple one, maybe this, this event here is where the universe split with using the universe splitter. And, uh, you know, the guy's, guy's sitting in the, on the ground over here and here he's jumped through the sky. The person who's in each of these universes doesn't see or feel or know about any of the others through their direct experience. Uh, but that's fine. There's nothing about this that isn't exactly what we observe. And the, the path through this seeming paradox is to remember that all of these endpoints are entire worlds, all with every single thing determined, including the trajectory through the past that got you there. So every human and, 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 and bunny rabbit and blade of grass in this particular bubble all agree on everything that happened within their, call it consistent history, tracing back to the Big Bang. But that's also true on the purple branch. And it's also true on any of these branches. Every single branch has the same fact that every single thing in it will agree on every single thing that happened from the beginning of time to now, even though they're all different. So you might ask, are these branches just some weird mathematical thing? Or do they have some, are they really real in the sense that there's someone who is uh, that made slightly different life choices or random events happen differently, and now you're the king of France, all right? Is that really a thing? Like, is there a place somewhere in some weird abstract space where you are the king or queen of France? Is that a thing, or is it just some weird mathematical thing? So, again, I'm going to go back to where what this is and what it isn't. If you take quantum mechanics seriously, there is a you that's right now the king or queen of France. So yeah, that seems to be a very strange thing. So where is the evidence for any of this particular thing? And one of the pieces of evidence is that this is the way quantum computers work. Quantum computers harness the fact that there are branches of this wave function that are nearly identical. So imagine two universes where everything is the exact same, everything, except which photon, where the photon hit that detector. Everything else is exactly the same, except that one thing. The reason why you can recombine those photons and do what's called macros or quantum coherence experiments is that the two branches of the wave function that differ only by those small numbers of degrees of freedom are not far enough apart that they are so different that they don't talk to each other anymore. Think about it like this. Think about everything there is as a vector. So it's, a, it's like a, a thing with direction in some gigantically huge space. And think about the ability of this thing to talk to or affect another one of these branches as being the inner product between vectors. So the closer they are, the bigger that inner product gets. The farther they are, the harder it is to get some non-zero value of their overlap. So the, 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 the interplay of these things is very limited. And most for most practical purposes, these two things are so different that they can't interact anymore. They're so far apart that they don't talk to each other anymore. And if you're in one, you can't see the other. But that's not generally true. Anytime you build a quantum coherence or quantum tunneling or whatever, any of these sorts of quantum things where you can actually see the effects of quantum mechanics directly, another way of thinking about why you see quantum stuff and not our, you know, the, the, what you could call classical physics is that the overlap between these, these different branches is large enough so that they can interfere with each other. So instead of these branches always going away, there are cases where they don't and they kind of like run parallel to each other and they knock into each other. And that knocking into each other is the resource that is used to build quantum computers. 
Yeah, so just wanted to reinforce that this other side of like why why are we in where we're in is is a fundamentally random thing. Okay. So I've gone on about physics long enough and now I, I want to get to the point that I was going to make or trying to make. And that the the modern uh perception of physics, that is the pillars, the two pillars of modern physics, which are the framework of quantum mechanics and the framework of general relativity have no room for free will. There is nowhere in either of these pictures that allows for what you could consider a decision to be made. Now, things do happen that lead to different outcomes, like the universe splitter, but how those things happen on a fundamental level is essentially random. And by essentially, I mean, in its essence, there is nothing underneath that randomness. And there is no mechanism whatsoever for what we call um, we, we call decision making in the free uh, the the usual sense of free will, and uh, uh, this this point is so important that I want to just uh, to to emphasize it or maybe belabor it a little bit, is that this widely held, intuitive, deeply dogmatic belief that there's a thing called free will where there's a you that chooses amongst outcomes is incompatible with modern physics. It just is. So you only, there's only one way out of this if you hold to the, the, the dogma of free will, and that's that modern physics is wrong. There is no way to reconcile the things that have given us every technological artifact we have, all of our understanding of the world, the entirety of it, there is no way to reconcile that with a thing that would be a starting point for most people understanding how minds work. You know, I am absolutely sure that nearly everybody in the audience right now has immediately discounted everything I said. Because you believe that there cannot be a possibility that you don't have free will. I'm I'm sure of it because the the these dogma can run so deep and they're so intuitive and they're so connected with how we feel about who we are they're they're interlaced with our entire view of the world that you can't just pull one piece out of your entire world view willy-nilly because if you pull a foundational piece out of your world view your entire world view collapses and there's nothing left so uh uh, 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 an increasingly famous theoretical physicist, uh, Sabina Hossenfelder, who, who, by the way, I would recommend watching her stuff on the internet. She has a bunch of videos about the intersection of theoretical physics and things that people actually care about, like free will and things of the sort. Uh, she's great. Um, she has the right kind of combination of being an intensely um, critical skeptic who basically doesn't believe anything at all uh, unless she can prove it. Um, and and having a very deep understanding of the topics she's, she's talking about, so she's very she's very good, and I recommend uh, listening to her. But one of the one of the things that that kind of flavored my what I wanted to talk about today is is a talk that she did about the the, the sort of things that I'm talking about now. That nobody who studies theoretical physics would even uh, countenance the 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 idea that we actually have free will because it's in conflict with our, what we know about the world. And the, the point that she's making, of course, is that the reason why we hold so strongly to this particular belief is just political. It has nothing to do with science or what we know about the world. It has to do with these kinds of underlying dogmatic beliefs that we, we hold. So just to kind of, I'm going to put a fine, fine point on this. So, you know, in the Matrix where Morpheus offers Neo this choice, which is the red pill and the blue pill, and he has this wonderful monologue about, uh, you know, the choices that Neo has to make. Okay. What I'm telling you is that this makes just as much sense as if Morpheus was talking to a thermometer in the same scene. And he was saying, you have the choice of measuring 15 degrees or 22 degrees. And based on that, some big different thing will happen. Of course, we know that thermometers don't make choices about what the temperature they read is. It's just physics. It's a mechanism which is a, is a consequence of the known laws of thermodynamics and the expansion of mercury and all of that. What I'm telling you is that what science says is that there is no fundamental difference between a person making a decision 
and the thermometer reacting to its environment. Like it or not, that's what science says. So uh, the, in closing, it is difficult and, uh, and sometimes bizarre to try to look at the world without the blinders that come from our desires, our intuitions, and our deeply held beliefs. It particularly is important to do that when we're trying to understand how minds work. We cannot allow ourselves, when we enter into this type of, of realm, to just take things for granted that we think make sense. Our sense of self, feeling that we have free will, the, the feelings we have about the what, what is good in life and purpose and all of those things, all of these long list of characteristics of the human mind, maybe they're all true and maybe those things all make sense in some level, but we can't take that for granted. This study, if uh, above all else, requires the ab initio um, questioning of all of our fundamental beliefs in order to make progress. So this is one of the biggest meta problems of studying the mind is to try to strip away the um, uh, the uh, the dogma that that uh, that that kind of follows us around. Even with all that being said, there's a lot of progress that's being made. And I'll just close with a, a, a prediction from a, a person that I uh, trust and admire, who is the, the 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 godfather of reinforcement learning and and um, um, uh, just an all-around great guy. About given all this difficulty, when will we finally break through and and do something that is a creation of a mind like a human's? And he thinks that it's it's imminent, and and I agree. All right, thanks everybody for your attention. I hope you were both entertained uh, and educated. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jordi. Great, uh, great talk, and and uh, lots of questions come to mind. And I definitely encourage folks on the uh, on YouTube uh, on our live stream to put their questions in chat, and I'll bring them up as we get them. I have a question then for you, Jordi, which is very interesting. So you've sort of um, inspired me to, to re-examine the very paradigm through which I look at this notion of, of artificial intelligence in general, but specifically AGI versus what we really hear about nowadays, the, the shallow AI or the narrow AI, where we get into a task-specific learning. And then we hear about this notion of multitask learning, where you can train these uh, language models with trillions of parameters now, Recently, I saw a story that there was one now with more than a million, uh, trillion parameters. Uh, so, so the framing is always, Jordi, that uh, it's it's linear, that if you have enough of these models doing enough of the things incrementally, iteratively, sort of in a linear, continuous path, then eventually we'll get there. And what's fascinating in what you just said is that actually that's not necessarily the right thing. Yes, you may have these AI ensembles, these ensembles of models that allow you to do more and more things, but that is not really comparable to the notion of a general intelligence. Uh, is, is that kind of sort of the way you, you're framing it, Jordi? Or uh, how would you look at that? How would you respond to that? Well, um, again, this is kind of comes back to a definitional issue about what a general intelligence is. So my, my perspective, and I realize there are others, is that general intelligences are control systems for robots. So in our in the biological case, the robot is the body of the animal. Um, the, the the mind, if you want to use that word, is the control system. If you're if you view uh, cognition through that lens, then the uh, the types of things that are usually looked at as like task based approaches to AI aren't completely useless. You know, we we learn a lot when we build things like GPT three or or um, you know the Mu zero stuff that the 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 progression of, of models that that um, DeepMind has has built, but they're not the thing that I would call um, it's not framed in the correct way. So the the way that I've always framed the problem is is. Uh, Brains evolved to control bodies. That's what they're for. You know that that that's their purpose. Um, they have side effects. A lot of these sort of task-based things are more about trying to build machines that are kind of a replication of the side effects of cognition, which is fine. You know that's a thing, uh, but it's not cognition. Cognition is the cause of those effects. 
So if you want to get down to the root of what causes the effects and build something that is like a human like intelligence or an intelligence of an animal, um, it's not okay to just focus on specific tasks. You're not going to, you're not, you're not attacking the core problem. So how do you attack the core problem? You build a control system for a robot. Why is that related to AGI? It's because any body in the physical world needs to deal with an enormous amount of uncertainty. And that requires generality. It's not okay to build a robot that's supposed to wander around the world if it can't deal with all of the different as yet unseen situations that will come across. The real world enforces generality of the sort that is the root cause of our ability to think about things. So again, going down to the ab initio stuff, if you think about the study of AI as being kind of like a like a, 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 a center and a bunch of blossoming outer sides, most people study the leaves of this tree. They're kind of looking at the uses of the eventual end uses of something like cognition to solve a particular problem. What I'm more interested in is where does it all come from to begin with? And I think most people who are in the general intelligence camp want to get to that little cool nugget. And there are lots of different ways to do it. My view is, build a robot control system and you will have cracked the core problem of general intelligence. Not everybody agrees, of course, but uh, that's right because this is a hard problem. It needs a diverse number of activities, but building something that recognizes um, cats and photos is only peripherally related to the problem. That thing might be a part of a cognition, like a, a module that you use to do other things, but that in itself has nothing to do with intelligence or if it does, it's very peripheral. Very interesting, Jordi. Thank you. We have a question uh, in the audience here. Uh, is it enough to argue that free will can't exist from the biological side without deep diving into physics? Are we not limited just by the physical constraints of our brains? Uh, so that's the, the, so. This is a, a very interesting question um, from a bunch of different perspectives. So I'm going to sidestep it by saying I'm not a biologist, and my um, my. Uh, uh, my, in, my, my grounding as a scientist is in the physical sciences. So my perspective is colored by that. I am uh, giving you a perspective that takes for granted that the properties of larger scale things arise from the properties of the underlying constituent particles. So because you're made out of atoms, you should obey the rules those atoms do. Now, not, that might not be true. So I think that this question about is there room in what I said for uh, you know a free will box or some other weird thing that is not within the scope of modern view of the world? The answer is yes, of course, because science is about questioning itself and, and, and you're never sure of anything. All you have is evidence, not facts. What I am saying, though, is that if we are, uh, if the rules that do govern our behavior are the same ones as govern the behaviors of atoms and electrons and so on, and we have no reason to think they're not, then my conclusion holds. And biology is just a, is just a, a word uh, for a type of physics. Thank you, Jordi. We have uh, one more question here. So uh, what are some concrete next steps that, that I mean, certainly Sanctuary is doing some groundbreaking work on AGI and you talked about Rich Sutton, but uh, what are some other perspectives? What are some other approaches if you can touch on to advance mm -hmm. the state of AGI? So this, this is a great question. The way, the way I would start is take the problem seriously. So often, especially if you're like a young researcher, somebody just starting out who's maybe doing a PhD or even an undergrad, um, there are questions you're not allowed to ask for a variety of reasons. So for me, when I started, it was things like you know, foundations of quantum mechanics. When I was learning quantum mechanics as an undergrad, you were not allowed to question the Copenhagen interpretation. Like it was just not allowed. It was wrong, obviously, but you weren't allowed to question it. So I think that the, the one thing I would tell everybody who's interested in general intelligence, regardless of the path you take through solving the problem, you're allowed to study this problem. You, it's not it's not a, a taboo thing. You know, there are lots and lots of things that are difficult where you might spend an entire career trying to solve the problem and not. That doesn't mean that your your effort is in vain. You know, the, I think that the better thing to do for everybody is do the thing you think is the most important thing in the world, no matter what the people around you are telling you. Your supervisor might tell you, don't do that. You can get a job at Google making a million dollars a year if you can learn how to like build a use Keras and build a, a 
classifier for cats. Building classifiers for cats using Keras is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think you probably should know how to do that. But that has nothing to do with the underlying AGI problem. If you want to work on the real problem, work on it. Don't ask permission and choose your own path through that, what that means. For me, it's always resolving down to my roots as a physicist. So I have biases. I think about the world like a physicist. I think about the world. I don't believe what people tell me ever. I want to figure it out myself. And I think the, the, that's a way to, to progress. But the meta thing is you are allowed to work on this problem. You can say, I am trying to build a human mind. You can say that, or I am trying to understand the human mind. Um, it used to be that you couldn't, you know, not so long ago, if you were, if you were working on what we call AGI now, uh, you were some kind of a fringe guy who went to the three conferences a year that does this. And half the people around you were like, you know, Deepak Chopra. That, that's not the way it is anymore. I mean, this problem has now got a lot of money, effort, and serious people behind it. Uh, choose your own adventure or allow it to be chosen for you by the randomness of the universe. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, uh, go nuts. We need more people working on the problem from all different perspectives. That's great, Jordi. Great to hear that. And as we come to the uh, to the end of the talk, I do want to share an interesting comment from uh, from the audience. Is paradoxically, the more you believe free will isn't real, the less free you are. And there's a few people agreeing with that on chat. So that's great. Yeah. So the the weird thing about people who think about free will the way I do is they have this strange notion that it doesn't matter. So the, usually what it comes with the, the, the lack of belief in free will comes from this uh, is, seems to be entangled with a, a, a worldview that it absolutely doesn't matter at all that, that that's true. I find that very peculiar myself because I think it's actually something that does matter because it's something that may be true about the universe that doesn't comport with uh, what you know we want to believe. Uh, and true things about the universe that are the opposite of what we want to believe are very important for humans to, to, to wrap their heads around. Um, things that are the way we think they are and want them to be, those are easy. The hard things is when a truth about the universe is not the way we want it to be, and uh, it, it, it hurts to think about it, uh, but where that, that pain is the nugget of progress, is that accepting things that are true, even if you don't want them to be, is the starting point for, 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 uh, for Cambrian explosions of consequences of accepting something may be true, even though you don't want it to be. Excellent. And Jordi, we can't have uh, the co-founder of D-Wave and, and Kindred and Sanctuary AI without this question coming up, which is, are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we uh, um, so the, uh, well, I haven't said much about Sanctuary. We're kind of like midway between Boston Dynamics and OpenAI. Uh, we're attempting to put those two worlds together, the world's most sophisticated robots together with the world's most sophisticated control systems with the flavor of reinforcement learning and, and you know, what's known about how to do that well. Uh, we are hiring, of course. Um, if, you're, if you have a background in, um, if you're a physicist, you're high up. Uh, if you're a physicist that wants to learn about robotics or AI, uh, that's great. Um, if you're somebody with a background and a specialized background in either of those two fields, that's great too. Uh, and even more importantly than any of that, if you're a potential user of a robot that has some basic notion of cognition, a, a customer, a partner, uh, I'd like to hear from you. Thank you very much, Jody. And this was an amazing, thoughtful, and thought-provoking conversation. And we can't wait to have you back when you're going to dive even deeper into quantum uh, quantum aspects uh, applied to machine learning. I, I didn't realize that in this talk, we were going to go down into so much detail, and then you masterfully <laughs> tied it into sort of the notion of AGI. But looking forward to having you back, Jody, and good luck with Sanctuary AI. And I'm sure you'll receive a, a, a flurry of resumes now as a result of this talk. So looking forward to how you deal with them. Well, that would be great. And thanks, everybody, for uh, for spending an hour with us this morning. <laughs>